that we left off in October of 1938. And one of the things we had been talking about over the whole period of 33 to 38 uh, was uh, the factor of unintended consequences, uh, that many times the Nazis took action A, uh, and often it then brought about a different result, a B, uh, which then forced them or led them to do some other action C, uh, none of which could have been uh, terribly predictable. Uh, but they do have to respond to the changing circumstances, which often they themselves set in motion. Uh, and one of these uh, was uh, the case in October 1938, uh, when the German government decided it would expel from Germany all the Jews of Polish citizenship living in Germany before their Polish passports expired. It was the Polish government that took the initiative to say that all Poles living abroad had to have their passports renewed at their closest embassy or consulate before the end of October 1938. And when Polish Jews living in Germany came to their consulates and embassies, in fact, uh, the renewal of the passport was refused. Uh, and it was very clear to the Germans that the Polish game was to then declare these people stateless, to leave Germany, quote, stuck uh, with uh, the now stateless uh, Jews, formerly of Polish citizenship. Uh, Poland didn't put, want them back, uh, but for Germans this would present the problem that how could you ever force these people to emigrate further, which was of course their main goal, to force the emigration of all Jews in Germany, uh, if they were stateless and without passports. It was hard enough to get anyone to emigrate because everybody else was putting up emigration barriers. Uh, for people without passports, it was simply impossible. So very much on the spur of the moment, uh, in the last week of October, uh, the Germans decided they would round up the, the thousands of Polish Jews living in Germany, uh, put them on trains, and ship them to the Polish border to dump them back into Poland. And this they proceeded to do. Uh, it was, in a sense, a dry run for later deportations, the first point at which they actually chartered special trains, organized police to t round up the entire targeted group of Jews in, the city, in each of the major cities, put them on trains, and ship them off. Uh, at the Polish border, the Polish government refused to accept them, blocked the border, and the Jews simply dumped them into no man's land. So you had thousands of Jews uh, now in the small strip of land between the German border and the Polish border, living in what were ramshackle ad hoc uh, refugee camps, putting up tents and whatever else they could uh, in late October with window, winter approaching and a diplomatic stalemate between the German and Polish governments uh, from which uh, the main victims were, of course, the Polish Jews uh, stuck in the middle. One of the families uh, that was expelled from Germany and not admitted into Poland and thus caught in this no man's land between the two countries, uh, had a, a son who had earlier left Germany to Belgium illegally, had been expelled by the Belgian police over the border into France, uh, and was living in Paris as a, what we would now say, an undocumented illegal uh, immigrant. And his name was Herschel Greenspan. And Herschel Greenspan was trying to make a living in Paris when he had no papers and no right to work, and if caught, could be expelled to wherever the French police could dump him. When he heard about uh, the fate of his family, uh, he went to the German embassy uh, and uh, asked uh, to meet with uh, Ernst von Roth, the third attaché. Uh, there was shouting heard from the room. And then uh, shots were fired, and Grinspan had pulled out a pistol and shot the third attaché of the German embassy, uh, who uh, would be severely wounded, taken to hospital, and as we shall see, die several years, several days later. The French, of course, immediately arrested him for uh, attempted murder. Uh, and the question, in a sense, was uh, why and how uh, this had happened. Uh, the Germans, when they got to uh, France, later conquered France, they also then took possession of Herschel Grinspan uh, and uh, were going to put him on trial and a showcase trial 
to show him as, expose him uh, as the tool of international Jewish terror, shooting down German diplomats. And this was going to be a showcase trial for German anti-Semitic propaganda to prove the existence of the world Jewish conspiracy. Herschel Grinspan uh, managed to counter that uh, by saying he had a homosexual relationship with Ernst Roth uh, and had, uh, this was a lover's quarrel and he had shot him uh, because he wouldn't help his parents and the Germans did not want a showcase trial. Uh, based on a illicit homosexual relationship between a young Jewish boy and a distinguished German diplomat, and trial was not held. And for a long time, uh, in fact, uh, historians have sort of assumed this was a clever play by Grunspan, uh, that he had, in a sense, outmaneuvered uh, the, uh, the, the Nazis. Uh, subsequent research indicates, in fact, that may well have been the case. Grunspan was a young boy, no job, probably living as a hustler on the streets of Paris. They well have had an affair with Von Roth, who later medical records indicate was uh, homosexual, uh, and that he had gone to see him seeking help, and when the man wouldn't give it, enraged, that had shot him. Uh, so the story was not entirely fanciful, but may well have been based upon fact. We this is circumstantial evidence. We can't really know for sure because the Germans, of course, murdered Grinspan at the end of the war before he would have been liberated, and uh, we had never been able to get his real side of the story uh, without uh, we, what we know of what he said was simply the Gestapo interrogation records. Whatever the case may be there, uh, the repercussions of this were catastrophic. Uh, Hitler meets in Nuremberg, uh, or in Munich, I should say, uh, every uh, anniversary of the Beer Hall Putsch, November 9, November 10 uh, of each year. He meets with the, quote, all fighters, uh, and this is a big celebration ritual in the Nazi party. Uh, and Hitler is there uh, with all of the old party faithful uh, when news comes that von Roth had died of his wounds. That this is now a case of, of a of fatality. Uh, Hitler was scheduled to speak that night. Uh, what we do know from witnesses is that Hitler and Goebbels were seen in close conversation for quite some time. And then Hitler left early, uh, and Goebbels addressed the crowd instead. Uh, and basically, Goebbels uh, sort of gave a green light and an incitement. Von Roth has died. Now is the time for all good Germans with her healthy racial instinct to take out the appropriate revenge upon uh, German Jews who are uh, the uh, tools of the world Jewish conspiracy. Germans will know what the proper reaction uh, is, uh, and uh, this will be understood by the authorities. The speech is over, and virtually every of the oil fighters in the room rushes to the telephone calls back to their town party uh, cell and SA unit and says, at last we have permission to carry out uh, violence in the streets. We have the go-ahead for a great anti-Jewish riot, for the pogrom we have been listing for, waiting for, uh, and have been denied all of these years. And what breaks out that night in Germany is uh, referred to either as the November pogrom or, or Kristallnacht. Kristallnacht literally in, uh, in, in German means uh, the, the night of crystals or the night of the broken glass because virtually every shop window of every German, of every Jewish store uh, is smashed and their businesses vandalized. Uh, virtually every synagogue in Germany is arsoned and burned down, over 400. Uh, numbers of people are beaten up. At least 100 or more people are murdered in the streets. Uh, and this is a wave of violence that basically shakes every town in Germany uh, in which the Nazi party uh, activists at last feel that they have been unleashed. But they understood perfectly well what Goebbels was saying and interpreted it correctly. The police receive instructions not to intervene, uh, that the fire departments are to intervene, not to put out the burning synagogues, but to protect any nearby buildings so they don't catch fire as well. Uh, and so uh, that this is, in fact, a totally sanctioned uh, and tolerated and instigated pogrom uh, in which the people at the top knew what buttons to push and the people under, under below knew exactly what was expected of them 
and everybody played their role. Uh, this was seen, at least by many, uh, as Goebbels' grab uh, to get his share of the action. Uh, he had been increasingly shut out by, Goebbel, by Himmler and Goering. Uh, and her, uh, Goering and Himmler, uh, Himmler are, in fact, not consulted. This takes them by surprise. Belatedly, in the evening, Heydrich, Himmler's deputy, sends out the, the, the orders for the police not to intervene. Uh, but this was all instigated by Goebbels, obviously with permission from uh, Hitler, but done on the spur of the moment without consulting the other top Nazi leaders. Uh, and, as I say, it is uh, a, a, a wave of vandalism and destruction uh, all over Germany. Anybody who wakes up in any German city in the morning uh, sees the burning hulks of synagogues, the smashed doors of windows. Streets are littered with broken glass. Uh, everybody knows uh, what has happened. Um, uh, and uh, this is say, it's, it's played out, uh, basically, uh, in public. It is a, 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 a great program. Uh, some people view the, the, the term night of broken glass, Kristallnacht, as a kind of euphemism and prefer the term for what it literally is, the November pogrom. But you will see both expressions, Kristallnacht, night of broken glass, or November pogrom, were all different terms that historians use to refer to this particular event uh, in early November of 1938. The reactions to this are very different by different people. For the party activists uh, and, and Goebbels, this is their celebration of violence, an orgy of violence, that they have at last been unleashed uh, and allowed uh, to carry out uh, a violent attack upon German Jews, unfettered. Uh, and uh, in the wake of it, in fact, uh, you know, they, uh, you know they, they have, in a sense, been uh, allowed finally to, to, as I say, do what many of them have had wanted to do, been restricted from doing for years. Uh, for, for German Jews, this is a shattering experience. Uh, whatever uh, hopes German Jews had up until now that somehow things will normalize, that somehow uh, they have, uh, that things will stabilize, uh, that the mixed messages they have been getting uh, between these waves of persecution and then periods of kind of lull, uh, that somehow things will, will basically stabilize, uh, is gone. Uh, that there is virtually no Jew in Germany that does not want out at this point, is not desperate to get out. Uh, the problem is, of course, uh, where do they go? Uh, and if you are signing up to be on waiting lists for emigration, uh, there is now only 10 months until the outbreak of war, which means that they're trapped that virtually no time for someone who hasn't already done the preliminaries, already applied for emigration to uh, various different countries before this, uh, for their number to come up for uh, the chance to emigrate to actually open between now uh, and the outbreak of war. So for Jews, it is uh, the confirming point that they have absolutely no future in Germany. Uh, there is no way of hoping to hold on and hold out, uh, that they have to get out. The problem is that many of them have no way any longer of, of getting out. Uh, the reaction among the German population at large uh, is a little harder to put one's finger on because the sources are more mixed. Uh, but we do have, and we'll talk about more of this in the later part of the course, what did the Germans know and when did they know it, to ask the Howard Baker question about the German public. Uh, that, as I say, this plays out in public. Everybody knows what has happened. Uh, and it seems there is, uh, at least in terms of the Nazi government's own intelligence reports, as a dictatorship, it wants to know what its population is thinking. It's trying to get the pulse of the population. How do you manipulate people if you don't know what point they are at? Uh, and so we do have uh, their own reports on the public uh, reaction. And it seems to be basically sort of twofold. On the one hand, uh, the government propaganda and policies up until now has successfully isolated Jews, successfully separated them from the German community successfully created a, uh, an, an acceptance or consensus that there was a Jewish problem, and it was legitimate for the government to solve that problem. But 
uh, unfettered violence or something else. Solving this Jewish problem by legislation, doing it uh, in an orderly, legal manner uh, that left the bulk of the German population uh, as, quote, the onlookers who can witness the misfortune of Jews losing their jobs and whatever, uh, but don't have to actually see people uh, getting beaten up in the streets or property destroyed or houses of worship desecrated. Uh, this allows them to kind of stand and accept it. But uh, to burn down houses of worship, to vandalize stores, to destroy public property, to beat up and murder people in the streets uh, is a little bit more than many Germans were ready to simply stand by on. So there's a negative reaction to the excess, a negative reaction to the unnecessary violence, the unnecessary destruction of property uh, that the regime basically learns it has gone too far, uh, that they have begun to make uh, many in Germany, quote, uneasy uh, about what is transpiring. Uh, and if many people had been indifferent up until now, indifference the government is quite happy with, uh, but to have a population that's uneasy uh, is one that is worrying about its capacity uh, to mobilize the population to steer their enthusiasm uh, is one that uh, they, uh, in fact, uh, are going to be somewhat more apprehensive about. Uh, and uh, the result is, and we must now look at, what was the impact of this on the government, on the Nazi party itself. Goering and Himmler are furious. Uh, they have been left out. They weren't consulted. Uh, and uh, for Goering, uh, particularly destruction of property is something that uh, he is not happy about. Uh, and uh, he and Himmler, in fact, go to Hitler and demand that he sacks Goebbels, fire him, get rid of him. Uh, Hitler will not do that. He backs up his minister of propaganda, who he, in fact, authorized to do this, uh, but does agree at long last that Goering will be put in charge henceforth of coordinating Jewish policy. For five years, no one has been in charge. You have had all sorts of people who have been uh, pushing for different aspects of policy, different kinds of policy, sometimes complementary, sometimes at odds with one another, and Hitler has occasionally had to intervene and be the referee, but no one has been in charge in actually coordinating all of this. Uh, and one upshot of Kristallnacht uh, is that Hitler is pushed to naming Goering as the man in charge of coordinating Jewish policy henceforth. So people that have proposals now have to take it and clear it with him. Goering in that capacity then summons the top Nazi leaders and the top representatives of the ministerial bureaucracy to a meeting in the Luftwaffe ministry, because he's also a minister of the German Air Force, the head of the Luftwaffe, uh, and uh, it makes clear two things. One, uh, he announces to them all uh, his new power. He has been authorized, Hitler, henceforth to coordinate Jewish policy. So the next time they have ideas, they have to bring them to him, an assertion of his new authority. And the second is to express his absolute fury at Goebbels and at what has happened. Goebbels is sitting in the front row there, and basically Himmler turns to him uh, and says, what did you think you were doing? Uh, all of those German businesses that you destroyed, I was going to confiscate and hand out to the Nazi party faithful. Uh, I was going to use some of this, of course, for economic recovery and, and rearmament. Uh, and here you have gone and destroyed property that belongs to the German people and was going to go into the hands of the deserving. Uh, and you have, uh, in your fit of uh, madness, uh, basically gone out and carried out this useless, senseless destruction of valuable property. Uh, all of this plate glass that you shattered was insured by German insurance companies. Are you trying to bankrupt the German insurance industry? Who's going to pay for this? Is the government going to subsidize it so they don't go bankrupt? Or are we going to bankrupt them because you had to break every shop glass window of every Jewish store in Germany? What did you think you were doing? That plate glass is made in Belgium for the most part. To buy replacement glass takes foreign currency. I don't have any foreign currency, and what I have I need for rearmament. What are you going to replace all this? What did you think you were doing? I mean, it's an amazing. Uh, uh, transcript to read. 
uh, in which he points out all of the negative repercussions on the economy and on him uh, and his plans uh, because you have this fit of destruction uh, of Jewish property uh, and all of the unintended repercussions it has uh, on foreign currency, on the insurance companies, and so on and so forth. Uh, having made very clear to Goebbels this will never happen again, and in fact there is no further program in Germany. One thing settled in the wake of Kristallnacht is this is the last program in Germany. There will be another, no other outbreak of nationwide violence against the Jews on German soil. Now, you can outsource programs to Eastern Europe, and there will be plenty of violence in the streets there, but it will not place, take place in German cities on German streets uh, and, and at the cost of German property, uh, and that uh, is, is settled. They then uh, do, in fact, find ways to get around these problems. Uh, if you have to take care of the insurance policies without bankrupting the German insurance industry and without government subsidies, well, you make the victims pay. So a special 25% property tax is levied on Jewish property uh, uh, bec uh, for instigating the riot, uh, and the Jews will pay for the damage that has been done to them, and the insurance companies are off the hook. Uh, and then, uh, uh, basically, uh, they decide on some other measures to accelerate Germany now is going to grab the rest of the Jewish property with no delay. And in fact, the next several months, uh, the complete uh, finishing off of the confiscation of, of Jewish property in Germany is done. Uh, and Goering is going to take no chances uh, that anything happens to it before he gets his hands on it. So Kristallnacht leads to uh, the final and very rapid and quick economic death of German Jewry. Uh, the last seizure of Jewish property, insofar as it hadn't happened already, and uh, the impoverishment of German Jews uh, is basically complete by the end of the year. Uh, for many abroad, the impact of Kristallnacht is shocking. Uh, just a month before, the Allies had signed the Munich Agreement with Hitler. Chamberlain had flown home and said, it is peace in our time. Uh, and there was hope that somehow uh, things would work out. And now, a little over a month after the Munich Agreement, uh, Hitler has revealed the true barbarism of the Nazi regime. Uh, and faith in appeasement erodes very quickly. This is one of the major factors uh, that will change how Britain and the other countries of Europe react to Germany over the next year, and why in September 1939 there will not be a repeat of Munich uh, as in September 1938, and when Hitler invades Poland, in fact, they declare war on him uh, rather than back down, which he had expected. And in his plans to attack Poland, he said, I've, I know these worms. I saw them at Munich. Uh, they don't have the guts for war. Uh, and so he was misled and uh, because he doesn't understand how his own actions, in fact, would bring about uh, a however slow learning curve. There is a learning curve on the Allies' side to which uh, the program, uh, the Kristallnacht, is a major contributing factor. The acceleration of the confiscation of Jewish property, of course, only makes it even more difficult uh, to expel and force emigration of German Jews. Uh, and this is, again, where you have two policies that conflict with one another that the Nazis pursue simultaneously. Uh, to make life so miserable in Germany that Jews want to leave, but to so take away their property that leaving is that much harder. Uh, and uh, so uh, the, the issue again is raised, uh, do we even continue trying to force emigration? And quite consistently, Hitler once again opts for those that say, go ahead, continue to try to pursue emigration, this time in the wake of the Evian talks by opening up secret negotiations. I remember at Evian, Germany would not come because they thought this was a public forum simply to blame them for the problem. Uh, but in the wake of these talks, Hitler does approve that Schacht, his old minister of economics, who he basically fired from that, but who has a kind of reasonable standing among the allies, will be hauled out of retirement uh, and put in contact with uh, a man named George Woodley, who is negotiating on behalf of the Evian conference, to see if they can work out. Uh, in fact, some way to find both reception lands 
and someone else who will pay for the emigration. Obviously, German Jews can't pay for their own immigration any longer. Uh, they have been totally impoverished. Uh, but it's a hope to find some place where Jews can go and someone who will help to pay for it. Hitler is still pursuing the emigration option at this point, despite many others who are pressing him uh, to scrap the whole enterprise as, as rather hopeless. This is that's where, in a sense, things stand in January of 1939. Hitler has opted to continue to push emigration, however difficult it may be. And for those who have at least already uh, gotten themselves on emigration lists and who may have family members abroad that can help them financially to do it, emigration does continue from Germany. Uh, and, in fact, uh, many people leave in 1939. Uh, and there are a few places where they can still go. Uh, that uh, the only really truly open place in the world at this point where there's no immigration hurdle uh, is the international uh, section of Shanghai. And so you have boats leaving Germany uh, and people crossing the Soviet Union trying to get to Shanghai. Uh, and thousands of Jews are flooding into the international district of Shanghai uh, where there will be a, a Jewish community of refugees uh, for uh, the period of the war uh, and uh, where they will, for the most part, survive. Uh, so emigration does continue, uh, but it is face facing ever greater kinds of obstacles. On the end of January, on January 30th, celebrating, I mean, basically Hitler always does things on the anniversary dates uh, of memorable dates of the Nazi Party movement whether it be the uh, Beer Hall Putsch, which helped launch the, the, you know, the Kristallnacht, or, or January 30th, of course, the anniversary of his coming to power. Uh, and so on January 30th, 1939, uh, he gives a long two-hour-plus speech to the German Reichstag. Uh, and, of course, the Reichstag is nothing more than now a audience for speeches. It isn't a legislative body any longer. Uh, and uh, it is a rambling speech that covers all sorts of topics. Uh, but in the middle of that speech, he devotes about two paragraphs to uh, the, what the Nazis refer to as the Jewish question. Uh, and in hindsight, uh, this is a, a very important section of his speech. Indeed, uh, all the Nazi listeners realized it was. There are many references um, to, among Nazis themselves after the fact to uh, this uh, particular part of Hitler's speech. So they picked up the hints as well uh, that uh, this was uh, not uh, just a pro formula uh, kind of exercise, but Hitler was in fact intending uh, to communicate to them, to them. The question is, what was he intending to communicate? In the middle of this speech, he uh, turns to uh, the issue of the Jews still in Germany and then mocks the Allies uh, the Allies are criticizing for how he treats German Jews. If they think German Jews are so wonderful, all they have to do uh, is open their immigration gates. They are welcome to them. He would nothing more like to do nothing more than to give the rest of the world all of his Jews uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, and, of course, accuses them of the hypocrisy of criticizing how Germany uh, treats its Jews but won't take these people off Germany's hands. So it is a, a mocking of the Allies and, of course, getting lots of laughs from his audience in doing this. Uh, then in the second paragraph, uh, he goes on to say uh, that in the early days, of course, the Jews laughed at him, uh, mocked him. Uh, he says, are they still laughing now? Uh, and he turns himself into the bully turned victim. Uh, he, of course, has been the victim of Jewish scorn, and now the tables will be turned. Uh, and he says, I have a prophecy. I will once again uh, be a prophet. And when Hitler prophesies, people listen because, in a sense, the Hitler prophecy is telling people what they have to make come true uh, because Hitler has to be made infallible. And so Hitler gives another prophecy, and sometimes this refer is referred to as the Reichstag prophecy, in which he says uh, his prophecy is that if world Jewry plunges Europe once again into a world war, it will not be the destruction of Germany, but it will result in the destruction of the Jewish race in Europe. Not the, it will not result in the destruction of Germany, but it will result in the destruction of the Jewish race in Europe. 
So for historians, uh, the question is, as it was for Hitler's listeners, is what did he mean? What was he trying to communicate? One interpretation, the intentionalist interpretation, is that he was basically announcing the final solution. He knows he's going to war. He's been planning war uh, by timetable since 1936, at least. Uh, and so when he says, when Jew world Jewry if world Jewry plunges us into a new war, uh, this is no if. He's going to make that happen. The consequences are going to be the destruction of the Jews in Europe. The consequences are going to be Auschwitz to the final solution. And this is interpreted as a sign of Hitler's premeditated goals, his grand design, his plan, that he knew where all this was going, uh, and he is letting his followers know now and know in certain terms what the end goal of Nazi Jewish policy is. That is the intentionalist interpretation to me. That's a second interpretation is to see this as uh, Hitler's uh, sort of diplomatic brinksmanship. Uh, what some historians refer to as a hostage policy. Uh, he has complained that the Allies wouldn't take Jews off his hands, uh, and uh, now he is uh, threatening them, if you don't take them off my hands, uh, this will have dire consequences. He's in a sense trying to blackmail them into opening their emigration gates, uh, or at least letting them know uh, that uh, Jews in Europe will be held hostage for their good behavior, if he wants to get away with more bloodless conquests, con conquests, they can't let it come to another war in Europe. Uh, and uh, that this is part of a, uh, of a complicated diplomatic game in which the Jews of Europe are going to be held hostage for, by him in order to get what he wants in foreign policy as best he can. And that's, in a sense, uh, sort of a second one, that, that, that's a second way of looking at this and trying to figure out who was Hitler talking to and what was he trying to say? A third interpretation, and the one that I think is the most plausible, uh, one I lean to, is that uh, this is a signal to his followers that the way in which they look at Jewish policy in Europe uh, and, and the way in which they understand what they're trying to achieve uh, is now going to be carried out on an utterly different scale. Up until now, Germany has been trying to solve the Jewish question in Germany. And the goal of solving it in Germany is through removing the Jews altogether, through forced emigration. Now that he knows war is coming, uh, and then the question is, uh, there is not just a Jewish question in Germany, because he intends to conquer Europe. He has a European Jewish question, not just a German Jewish question, that Conquest of Europe is going to mean the Nazis are going to have to solve a European-wide Jewish question, and it must somehow end in, uh, quote, the destruction of the Jewish race in Europe. But what that means uh, is still open. Uh, we will see that there are going to be a number of attempts to carry out uh, a end of the Jewish race in Europe that are not yet gas chambers and death camps. Uh, and that uh, Himmler and others, who are the ones who understand what Hitler wants the best, uh, in fact decide and pursue a series of European expulsion plans to get rid of the Jews, not just out of Germany, but to get move them out of Europe uh, to some kind of reservation, to some kind of uh, dumping ground where you can round up the Jews of Europe and put them somewhere else. Uh, and so that Hitler's understanding of this, I will be arguing after the exam, uh, is that initially this is still seen in the framework of expulsion, but expulsion carried out on a much vaster scale, carried out on a European scale, because Hitler says this now applies to all Europe, and it will only be when those things fail uh, that Hitler decides it's easier to kill Jews than to expel them, and they go to Hitler with a different plan. Uh, but in any case, I did want to let you know that the historians look at this speech in different ways. It's a, it's a prime example of how people can look at the very same words on the very same document and think they mean different things. Uh, and even among Nazis, in all probability, they had different understandings. Uh, they were all trying to figure out, uh, in working towards the Fuhrer, what does he expect of me, which means you have to understand what is he trying to say, what does he mean. 
uh, and Hitler say, talks in these prophecies in vague terms, uh, and different people do interpret that in different ways. Nazis at the time did, historians have after, and so in the end, I think one has to look at the bigger context. What did the Nazis do between 1939 and 1941, if you want to figure out what Hitler meant in his prophecy of 1939? Uh, but that will take us uh, to, uh, to the, next, uh, the next section after the exam. In any case, uh, it is, uh, as I say, uh, sort of the last major uh, Hitler statement on this before the war. Uh, whether war was coming in September 39 or the next year, the four-year plan was specified 1940 rather than 1939. So he does, in fact, get a war about uh, a little bit before he had actually date scheduled it uh, because he thought the Allies would back down in September 39, and they didn't. Uh, but in any case, uh, that will, of course, change uh, the whole framework from a question of solving the Jewish question in Germany uh, to solving it in all the countries of Europe that Germany conquers. Uh, and that puts us into a very uh, different period, which we'll take up after the exam.